Hi, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. May we have a great day today, having carefully considered the alternatives. <laughs> so um, in, in terms of this uh, core challenge of creativity, um, one of the this notions, uh, the central notions that um, is relevant is this Kessler idea of a holon. And uh, holon, again, is, is a part-whole relationship. Um, and what we're looking to do uh, is have these different ways, these different positions, these different styles, these different truths, these different modalities, and then to have uh, connections flow between them in such a way that a greater whole emerges from them. Um, in the um, generative change work, uh, we talk about um, the, the three minds, if you will, and uh, finally found an application for my childhood ca Catholicism uh, in the name of the cognitive and the somatic and the holy field. Uh, so this is really the deep roots um, of the three minds and really emphasizing that to be at a generative level, um, we really need uh, a good, positive, um, developed connection with each of these minds. Um, uh, each mind will give you a type of competence, but what we're really interested in is competence plus, if you will. And, and so we're really saying that uh, creativity is always a conversation. Um, so I, I will often say, and because I, I deeply feel and experience that when you work with a client, um, the creative unconscious is not in the client. Um, it's not in uh, the coach or the therapist, but it's in the connection between. And so what we're looking at is, is a type of connection where um, some um, third presence emerges. Um, this is the challenge of, of generative intimacy. You know, in, in almost all of the couples models uh, that I know of um, talk about three stages of intimacy. In the first stage of intimacy, one plus one equals one. So you find your sweetheart, and it's basically a drug experience. I've been able to <clears throat> scientifically um, discover that nature puts you into a, a drugged trance state in order to, to uh, um, uh, lure you into the web. Uh, these drugs last only for nine months. So when you meet your sweetheart, uh, you go into a drug state. Ah, hi. You could see people out on the street. They're just looking, they're drooling at each other. And, and in that initial honeymoon phase, one plus one equals one. And you feel, sweetheart, when I'm with you, everything is okay. When I'm with you, all problems disappear. And you give me a feeling that I've always been looking for. And you'll always give it to me and you'll never change, right? <laughs> you'll never change, right? You're there <laughs> to give me that state of oneness for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> so the drugs, all drugs wear off. Uh, but the, this is a, I mean, it's a sweet phase, um, the honeymoon phase. Um, but we, we all know that, that the honeymoon doesn't last. And I don't mean that cynically. I just mean it straightforwardly. And the second phase of um, couples development, one plus one equals two. So what, what you begin to really uh, most sense is our differences. Uh, you're not like me. You're not doing it exactly the way that I think you should do it. Um, and the differences between the couple become much more paramount. This is usually the fight stage. It could be a hot fight. Uh, blah, blah, blah. It could be a cool fight. I'm going to the office. 
but it is it is a fight. There's a sense of um, upset, confusion uh, about the fact that um, the feeling of eternal oneness that we had that was so promising is no longer there. Okay. So you're you're really doing a lot of practical details in terms of can is it possible for us to 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 put effort and to put commitment in terms of of really developing a workable intimate relationship. So whereas in, in the first phase everything works, um, in the second phase you really have to work at it. You know, and if you talk to uh, couples that that have a long-term, re reasonably happy relationship, you know, one of the things you, you hear from most people, it takes a lot of work. You know, it really takes a lot of work in terms of what it means to have have a living partnership that is able to uh, sustain itself through uh, the day-to-day -day activities. When people come in um, for uh, work or help, they're usually at the end of the second stage. So that uh, at the end of the stage where um, the, the differences are uh, really strong and they feel it's not possible anymore. What we once had um, is no longer there. We tried to get it back. It's not, it's not coming. Maybe the relationship is over. So uh, when I work with couples, they say that's usually where they are when they come in. So the third phase, uh, which is I think the mature, really deeply rewarding phase, is one plus one equals three. And in that type of intimacy, there's not a dissolution of the differences. It's not that you're in a fusion state with your partner. Your differences are very, very clear. Um, so you, there's my reality, and there's your reality, and then there is this uh, sacrifice, if you will, and I don't mean sacrifice in the negative sense, but sacrifice means to make sacred. So it, it's a surrender, not to, your, to another person, but it's a, a surrender to the relationship. Um, and it's really sort of asking the we-ness of the relationship to hold and to guide the both of you. And I think that's where the creative unconscious is able to come into the day-to-day -day activity. You know? So that sort of mathematics of one plus one equals three, that is the formula for creativity. Okay? So. <clears throat> Um, if we say those three minds that are, are the base brains and minds for intelligence, the, the somatic mind, the cognitive mind, the relational field mind, uh, and when we say that in isolation they don't have creativity. You know, we say the, the body, the somatic mind, in and of itself is not generative. It does seem to have this um, independent capacity um, for healing and always moving towards wholeness. Always moving towards wholeness. So that's the sort of the connection to nature. It's got an in intelligence of always looking to find a balance to be part of, of, of something greater. But it cannot really create something that never existed before. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read this book, uh, Sapiens, any of you? Did I mention that in here? Did I? What do you read in, in the UK anyway? This was actually, it's an uh, Israeli historian, uh, Jonathan Harare, I think. Harari, uh, yeah, okay, super. And, you know, Sapiens, that's us. You know, he, he sort of um, d delineates the, the history of the evolution and how Sapiens appeared as one strain of human beings, but, but once it appeared, it really, really took off. 
And he said, what is it that is unique about Sapiens that allowed it to basically go into hyperdrive? And he said, really, if there's one, one simple way to describe it, is that Sapiens is capable of believing in things that don't exist. Uh, to believe in things that don't exist. Okay? And we see the good, the bad, and the ugly around that. Yeah. But it means that I can imagine a world that has never existed before. Right? Um, he's got this, uh, he cites this idea, which I, I couldn't quite uh, find with the, the research he, he was referring to. But he says, if sapiens is, is the only species that can socially organize in groups larger than 80. And did you read the book? Yeah, I know. Oh, you know him, okay. So, can you tell us why that is? Uh, well, I can say that what he says is that the, the optimal number is 115 that we're able to, uh, to have an intimate relationship with. Right. But why, why can't other species go beyond 80? Presumably because there's no biological necessity to do so. I mean, it is, um, I've just read, I haven't read my yeah. book, but I've got it there. Um, what I've taken from it, he, he comes up with the idea that it's, we, sapiens created the ability to tell stories. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, yeah, so, so we have a story, so we are Britain, for example, or we are America, or we are the land of the free, or we are the child of children of God, or whatever. And those particular narratives with their images and with their um, uh, di different languages give you this sense of belonging to something very, very big. Then this sense of, um, holding an image of something that it that has never existed before you know allows us to begin to um, create this future that um, other species never even think about right? so but if you you think you know sometimes you, we, we, we hear a lot of emphasis on the wisdom of the body or the, the um, creativity of the unconscious. And I think it's important to note that the unconscious in and of itself is not generative. It's only when the unconscious is connected to the cognitive mind in a certain way and you get this certain sort of, of, of harmonious conversation, that's where you get the really uh, uh, brilliant stuff. So uh, Erickson used to say, and this is really a, a big difference that I have with Erickson, the unconscious is very intelligent. Well, if the unconscious was so intelligent, what are they doing in the office? You know, what, what is the client doing in the office? I mean, if the unconscious was so brilliant, why are they mired in such problems? You know, but, but, sorry? Well, again, dreams are just uh, sort of these wild stories unless you do something with them. And I think there's, there's a lot of evidence that dreams are attempting to integrate, you know, which would make a lot of sense. You go out all day and you, uh, you're, you're focused on experiencing things in the world and you have all these different experiences and then there's a rest period. And in the rest period, there's not only, it's time to, for a restorative function, but it's time, uh, part of the, the restorative function is to bring wholeness. And so you have to take all these experiences, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and, be, and weave it into the totality of your being. So I think dreams are, as what I said, one of the singular,